Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, once again to this brilliant topic of a successful outcome in ovarian dysfunction. The audience is peppered to hear our guest today, none other than Dr. Josna Pundir from Parts Trust UK. MOGS, that is the Mumbai Obstetrics and Gynecological Society, presents today on 8th of August 2020 in partnership with Sun Pharma and our academic partner Science Integra, this wonderful webinar to you. As you all know, primary ovarian insufficiency was first used in 1942 by Fuller Albright, who first described this condition. In continuation to the same, we are going to talk about successful outcomes in ovarian dysfunction. And the most common words which a woman is told and how she feels after telling this, she has been given the diagnosis of primary ovarian insufficiency. And these are the two words which affects her. She is devastated. She is shocked. She is confused. And that's what we are going to talk today and address this medical aspect of management of ovarian dysfunction and successful outcome. And I call upon Dr. Jotsna Pundir from UK. I have to introduce her. She's a very well-known subspecialist consultant in reproductive medicine, specialist and surgery. She is also the lead for menopausal care at the Bart's Health NHS Trust an honorary senior lecturer at the Queen's Mary University, London. She is secretary of RCOG India License Group. She has also supervised in her educational endeavor in the field of subfertility, menopause, MRCOG part two courses. She has presented at various national and international conferences and has published widely in peer reviewed journals. Thank you, Dr. Josna. Thank you, Dr. Chow. Thank you very much for such a kind uh, uh, introduction. Um, and Reshma, thank you for the invite. Um, I can share my screen if this screen is taken off. And before you go ahead with yeah. your wonderful presentation, I am yeah. inviting our wonderful Beautiful, graceful, Dr. Reshma Pai, madam. As you are aware, she is the president of Mumbai Obstetrics and Gynecological Society. We have seen her dynamic work when she was a Foxy president in 2017. And of course, in 2018-19, we saw her charisma in endoscopy and infertility as a president of SR and IAG. And presently, madam, you have taken India on world map to be the assistant treasurer of International Federation of Fertility Societies. We all know that you have been practicing consultant as a gynecologist at Leelawati, Jaslo, and Hinduja hospitals. And recently, you were also conferred with the degree FRCOG by none other than the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Welcome, Dr. Reshma Pai. We are going to hear from you also. Thank you, madam. So with this, we hand over the mic to Dr. Jotsna from UK. And I request her to start her presentation. Thank you so much. Right. Uh, thank you so much for such a kind introduction, Dr. Chauhan and Reshma. Thank you for the invitation. Um, this is a pretty wide topic. And I'll try to do uh, justice as much as I can. Um, now, the problem is mainly that it's a very common condition. And there are a range of um, treatment options available. 
In the next few slides, what I'll try to do is to talk about a little bit of PCOS. How do you want to optimize everything before you want to start the patient on a pregnancy? The current evidence and guidelines and conclusion. Obviously, most of the evidence and guidelines will be based on systematic reviews, meta-analysis, and guidelines are the current international guidelines. So these are a, a huge document, freely available, released in 2018. Um, lots of bodies came together, mainly um, by Monash University and all the other international bodies, and a really nice, clear, huge document for every aspect of PCOS has been put forward. I will try to go through some of these and also we'll try to go through the, um, the evidence behind these guidelines. I'm going to skip to most of these early slides because I'm sure all of you know these. This is a complex disorders. There are clinical manifestations of oligomenorrhea and hyperandrogenism. There is a problem with metabolic syndrome in later part of the life. And there is a lot of understanding developing over there issues of psychological morbidity, such as reduced self-esteem and depression. It is the most common endocrine disorder in women. And it can be seen in up to 6 to 7% to, six to of general population. That was older data. And to be honest, if you look for the um, obesity incidence, I'm sure this must be much higher. But it can be seen up to 10% in women of childbearing age and 70 5% of anovulatory infertility could be because of PCOS. More importantly, particularly for Indian subcontinent, PCOS presents at a younger age, has more serious symptoms and higher prevalence of women in South Asian origin. We have also seen from the data that South Asian women, when they have migrated to Western countries, they somehow seem to have much more incidence of subsequent development of PCOS in terms of um, oligomenorrhea resulting into the syndrome. So they must have PCO gene uh, or PCO morphology, but somehow this genetic, this, uh, this migration seems to do something and increases their prevalence of developing PCOS. We all know Rotterdam criteria. Um, we, at that point, they said uh, more than 12 peripheral follicles or increased volume plus oligoanovulation or clinical or biochemical signs of hyperandrogenism. So you can have two out of three to label it as a PCOS. But the current international guideline is suggesting that if a woman has anovulation plus hyperandrogenism, you don't have to have to have a scan to make a diagnosis of PCOS. It will simply identify to complete the picture of PCOS phenotype. When I asked Professor Teed why was this being introduced, she said the main reason is to help with early diagnosis and management of these women in the developing world who don't have access to ultrasound scan. Huge range of symptoms from nothing to severe hyperandrogenism or severe menstrual disturbances leading to, it could be primary amenorrhea, secondary amenorrhea, of course, subfertility, androgenic symptoms, and long-term problems of insulin resistance, obesity, and metabolic syndrome can be the presenting features. In the current uh, guidelines, because the ultrasound scan uh, sensitivity has improved so much, the advice is with current scan machines, um, we better increase the threshold of PCO morphology to more than 20 follicles per ovary, or volume is still more than 10 mils. But if you're using older technology, stick to the older criteria, or at least stick to volume. And if in abdominal, stick to the volume. Definitely do not use scan to diagnose a girl who is gynecological, gynecological age is less than eight years, which is less than eight years after menarche because they have a high incidence of multifollicular ovaries. We all know about the background of insulin resistance. Both thin and obese PCOS can have insulin resistance and insulin resistance can be aggravated by obesity. More and more understanding is develop, developing over the obesity and eating disorders. This group of women have high incidence of eating disorders. As I said, obesity may be present in as much as 50% of these women. It can be chief complaint in 20% and body fat content is excess of body index. And they do have a body fat distribution is also different such as they're more like Android kind of obesity. 
Moving on very quickly to investigations, CRM AMH currently should not be used as an alternative for the detection of PCOM or as a single test for diagnosis of PCOS. Of course, there is emerging evidence that with improved standardization of assays and established cutoff levels based on large scale validation in populations of different ages and ethnicities, it will be more accurate in future, but currently it is not advised. These are our standard investigations, which I'm sure all of you do. LHFS is not needed for diagnosis anymore, but it helps you to differentiate other conditions. You want to have androgenic profile in terms of total testosterone, SHPG, and free androgen index. Prolactin levels may be mildly elevated in this group. We do do thyroid uh, function tests because um, a significant amount of these women may have some hypothyroidism and ultrasound to look at the morphology. Most importantly, if there is a clinical evidence of hyperandrogenism and the total testosterone is more than 5 nanomoles per liter, one must organize 17 hydroxyprogesterone to exclude androgen secreting tumors, late onset congenital hyperplasias, or Cushing syndrome. Main differential diagnosis which you really need to think about is the congenital adrenal hyperplasia, especially the, of course, the late one, which can mimic very similar to PCOS mild Cushing syndrome, and we cannot afford to miss vitalizing tumors, whether adrenal or ovarian. Very shortly, going through a case history, um, we saw a 35-year-old lady referred as polycystic ovarian syndrome, trying to conceive for the last two years, fairly regular cycles of 30 to 35 days with patent tubes, PCO morphology on transvaginal scan. So by this time, she had already tried for two years, so we said, fine, let's go through IVF. She had a fresh cycle with us, she had an egg collection, but we had to freeze her embryos because her endometrium remained thin. Then we brought her back for a, a frozen embryo cycle in HRT cycle. But again, the endometrium remained persistently thin. So we said, fine, let's do a hysteroscopy, see if there's any adhesions, etc. When I was doing the hysteroscopy, I suddenly noted under general anesthesia that she had some collateral erection. And it was noticeable in a sense that the clitoris was at least around two centimeters and large and much more thicker. So that made me to think. And then I went back and I organized the whole PCOS panel and the testosterone levels were raised to six. Then I organized the 17 hydroxyprogesterone early morning sample, which came back as elevated. We referred her to the genetic team and on further testing, she was having to note a 21 hydroxylase deficiency. What I'm trying to say here is this group of women with mild androgenic symptoms, she didn't really, she wasn't con concerned about her hirsutism or acne. She didn't have acne, but she wasn't really worried about her hirsutism. So in her symptomatology, it wasn't a big deal. Cycles were fairly 35 days, maximum maybe 40 days. So and they definitely have multifollicular appearance on their scans or PCO can coexist in them. Um, but the important thing is to not to miss these patients um, because this patient actually simply needed dexamethasone or prednisolone for suppression of adrenocortical axis and more importantly she needed PGD. So when you look at the differential diagnosis, this is where I would like to draw your attention that iandrogenic profile of testosterone, DHEAS, SHPG, free androgen index is important as a panel because you do not want to miss this. If total testosterone is high, you have to do 17 hydroxyprogesterone and you will be able to rule out late congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Very rare to find acromegaly in this group, but uh, that is another differential diagnosis. Cushing syndrome, then you will have to organize uh, free cortisol levels, which might be elevated. Importantly, androgen secreting tumors, adrenal source will have high DHEAS, and, and that will be really, really high androgen levels and much severe hirsutism and clitromegaly will be noticeable. And with this cholesterol pathway with 21 hydroxylase deficiency, none of these is being formed and there's no cortisol, aldosterone or less levels of cortisol. And that gives, keeps giving positive feedback here and more and more of progesterone gets converted into dihydro, dihydrotestosterone and more of progesterone. And that basically has very thin F, causes 
very thinning of endometrium and annulatory cycles, etc. And the treatment is very simple. You replace it and she will have significant improvement. So I just said that because the, the, the title was optimization. So optimization begins from this, the moment she steps into your office. So you need to make sure that she has PCOS, need to rule out the sinister stuff, and then you need to optimize her for her fertility. So general steps are same like anybody, particularly more emphasis on weight and BMI in this group of women. Some people believe in doing blood sugars or glucose tolerance tests. We do do it as a screen because our ladies, my catchment area is very much a South Asian subcontinent and we do find borderline um, glucose tolerance levels. Uh, but tubal patency, if the infertility is due to just anovulation and semen analysis is normal, current guidelines say that you don't have to do tubal patency test at this point. Uh, you can consider it if there is suspected tubal infertility. In practice, we generally are all right to do three cycles without checking tubes. But if she doesn't conceive in the low risk group of women, then we do organized tubal patency test. Occasionally, if a woman uh, asks or if she has high risk factors, we do it at the very beginning. So moving on to the management. Now, this, is, this has been the, the Bible of management for PCOS, where the first line is lifestyle and weight loss. Second line is pharmacological agents. Third is gonadotropin or laparoscopic ovarian diathermy or a combination of clomiphene plus metformin, and finally, assisted reproduction. So I'm going to touch base one by one. So first line, lifestyle and weight loss. And if within this, I'm going to add all other non-pharmacological interventions we have available. So when I say lifestyle intervention, we are talking about diet, exercise, or any behavioral strategies which will help you to lose some weight. It is suggested that the achievable goal should be five to 10% of weight loss particularly overweight people, and it can cause significant clinical improvement. And the international guidelines still recommend that patients should lose 5% of their initial weight before undergoing fertility treatment. Balanced diet is recommended to reduce energy intake. At least 30% of energy intake should be reduced. There's no evidence any particular diet works better than other. More importantly, at least 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensive physical activity at least three times a week is recommended. So the question really is, does it work? So this is the paper published in Human Reproduction Update. Um, and essentially, we went and looked on about all non-pharmacological interventions to see whether there is any evidence by undertaking them, it helps women with PCOS. So within these non-pharmacological interventions, there were four. This was an overview of systematic reviews. So there were four systematic reviews on lifestyle intervention, which is either diet or plus exercise or just exercise. Four on nutritional supplements like N-acetylcysteine, omega-3 fatty acids, inositols, and vitamin D. Alternative medical therapies, there were four reviews on Chinese herbal medicine or acupuncture. So there were actually 12 systematic reviews with a lot of randomized control trials included in them. And we looked at fertility, endocrine, glycemic, and weight-related outcomes, and assessed the strength of evidence by the GRADE system. So what did we find? This is a very busy table, but I really want you to focus on the fertility outcomes. So these are the fertility outcomes. So this is out of the whole existing literature at the moment, based on randomized control trial data. And you can see this is the outcome. Live birth rate was reported in one systematic review, which looked at n acetylcysteine versus placebo and chromaffin resistant PCOS had one trial, including 60 women. And of course, it's a very low quality evidence that it might be helpful. There's nothing, absolutely nothing else in the literature showing the benefit of any of these other interventions which will improve live birth rate in women with polycystic ovarian syndrome. 
even for clinical pregnancy rate if you can if you'd like to have a look this is the same systematic review one trial acetylcysteine versus placebo two trials chromatin resistant pcos again very low quality data that it might be helpful couple of systematic reviews on chinese herbal medicine and acupuncture again extremely low quality evidence that that may be helpful having said that the androgenic outcomes were not very dissimilar either there were quite a few systematic reviews suggesting significant benefit however there was still very low quality of data or evidence except a little bit of uh, benefit in terms of um pre androgen index same glycemic is actually a little bit better because quality of evidence was little bit more than the other outcomes so the primary evidence based on randomized studies is lacking for the most important fertility outcome of live birth rate in women with pcos n acetylcysteine and inositol show preliminary potential to improve fertility in women with pcos lifestyle intervention shows some benefit in improving her citizen and bmi lifestyle intervention inositol and acupuncture show some evidence of improvement in glycemic outcomes however very important to remember that almost all of these scored low or very low quality of evidence on the grade role of inositol and n acetyl need cysteine needs further evaluation based on this but what is the problem with lifestyle intervention we have been historically hammered in our head that people should lose weight and it is possibly not wrong because if you ask sometimes these women they will give you very clear history that their their cycles were fairly regular till 5 years ago and then it became irregular as they have started putting on weight they will not tell you this unless you specifically ask them and they do tell you that yes things changed since they put on weight and in their mind we give the diagnosis of pcos and they will tell you that pcos made me to put on weight so the education to women will be important however there are problems this is the biggest bl black elephant sitting in the room even though there, there is of course no evidence that it improves outcome despite the lack of such evidence international bodies recommend weight loss as a first line treatment in obese women these recommendations are actually based on extrapolation from benefit of weight loss on ovulation from observational studies in women with pcos and from reported association negative association between obesity and poor reproductive outcomes so this is all extrapolated from this data but I don't want you to go home and tell the girls you don't care about their weight it doesn't matter because there's no evidence because lack of evidence doesn't mean it is no evidence what it all means is currently we do not have enough data in the literature so you are very welcome to run trials and report in your cohort of women so the problem the black elephant here is we all know that prevention of weight gain or weight maintenance are associated with reduction in insulin resistance by reducing bmi and that can lead to improvement in metabolic and reproductive features weight management is important since overweight and obese women display worse clinical reproductive and metabolic features so it is in the good interest of the women that even if there's no data on fertility outcome that you continue to give the same advice that the more the weight they lose the better it will be for, for immediate on and for long term outcome however this is the biggest problem we have to acknowledge the challenges associated with sustainability of lifestyle interventions as almost every author has reported very high attrition rate in the majority of the studies therefore the benefits of lifestyle intervention on pcos may not be sustainable in the long term however good they are however good the trials are however good the women are their sustainability is a big problem there's a lots of research going on and hopefully we will have something in the next decade we must be aware of these limiting factors while counseling these women and of course it goes without saying that we need more research not only to see whether it helps but also how we can improve the sustainability <coughs> sorry moving on to inositol it's a non pharmacological intervention because it's an, a nutritional supplement 
Uh, in women with PCOS, a defect in tissue availability or altered metabolism of inositols or inositol phosphoglycan mediators has been suggested. So it seems like these are involved in the second messenger pathway in insulin signaling. And it is suggested that if you supplement inositol, it will improve insulin resistance uh, sensitivity. So epimerization of the 6-hydroxyl group of inositol gives you lots of isomers, out of which myoinositol and dichyroinositol has been studied. And they seem to have some potential improving, in improving the insulin sensitization. It did show some promising potential in improving the to endocrine outcomes. However, the, the individual studies were very small. So we undertook this systematic review, which was published in the BJOC. So basically, very quickly going through a couple of slides, we looked at the ovulation and menstrual cycle regularization. Please bear in mind that these are very few studies, very small number of women, however, showing significant benefit with dichyronositol. And again, very small numbers showing some benefit myonositol and you combine them that shows you significant benefit. When we looked at menstrual cycle regularization, again, very small numbers and some benefit. A very important take home message here is this. These are small number of studies with significant heterogeneity in terms of the population, in terms of the drug dose, in, in terms of the protocols, etc. However, we found based on these small studies that in inositol significantly increased the ovulation rate and the menstrual cycle regularization rate, or at least it improves the frequency of menstrual cycles. And by, when we did sensitivity analysis by combining these two, taking as regular menstrual cycles as a surrogate for ovulation induction, there was at least a threefold increase in the effect of inositols compared to placebo. It definitely sounds too good to be true, with a very huge caution here that these are really small studies with significant heterogeneity and therefore we have to be very very cautious it did show better number of studies better numbers and it did show significant benefit with androgen profile and also shbg levels also it did show some benefit with glycemic factors including all the parameters a significant benefit is noted and definitely better number of um, cohort and population so to conclude inositol in any form should currently be considered as an experimental therapy in pcos with emerging evidence on efficacy highlighting the need for further research so moving on to the second line which is clomiphene citrate letrozole and metformin or combination of the both. So these are the current guidelines. So <clears throat> we are assuming that they are fine. They don't have any other reasons of infertility. Current guidelines say letrozole should be considered first line pharmacological treatment to increase live birth rate. Risk of multiple pregnancy appear to be less. Of course, clomiphene can be used alone. Metformin can also be used alone. However, they're better effective agents. If you're using clomiphene, Maybe it's better to use in combination with metformin when using for obese women. Again, if you're using metformin, maybe it's better to use with clomiphene. Again, it's better to use the combination instead in the clomiphene resistant women. So the bottom line is letrozole is first line and you would rather do combination than the standalone ones. So where does this evidence come from? This is a very beautiful network meta-analysis published on BMJ 2017. And they look at all the all the agents used for PCOS uh, to improve the fertility. 57 trials and 8,000 women. The network meta-analysis, apart from giving you some graphs of various combinations, it also gives you a kind of ranking. So basically the surface under the ranking curve is used to provide a hierarchical ranking for different treatments. The efficacy of every intervention is expressed as a percentage was considered in relation to an imaginary intervention assumed to be the best. So you draw a line, think that this is the best, and then you draw all the other agents and see which one is the closest to the best. And you, you present that information as percentage. So higher surface under the cumulative curve values correspond to more effective treatment. So looking at the live birth rate, because that's all I'm really, at the end of the day, we are all interested mainly in the live birth rate, right? So I hope you, most of you possibly understand how these graphs work. So this tells you the number of trials or women 
uh, the thickness tells you the number and these are the direct um, comparisons if the direct comparisons are there you can by default do an indirect comparison as well but more importantly this is the graph under the curve and it showed that letrozole has the best probability of achieving a live birth rate followed by FSH and the combination of clomiphene and metformin. But importantly, please do not forget, this is very important that even if you do nothing, 10% can still have a baby. And it's not surprising because all women with PCOS are not infertile. They're still ovulating and they still have a chance of natural conception, maybe less if they have ovulatory cycle, but they do. Pregnancy rates, when you look at pregnancy rates, it seems like clomiphen plus metformin does, does give you higher pregnancy rate, but it does not reflect into live birth rate. FSH and letrozole, similar, almost similar. Ovulation rate, not surprisingly, FSH, because you keep going till she ovulates. But letrozole is almost as good as FSH and then the combination. Very important slide to take home. FSH, we all know it's good. However, it has a very high chance of giving you multiple pregnancy, followed by clomiphene, whereas letrozole has much, much, much less chance. So based on this, the conclusion was, compared to clomiphene alone, both letrozole and combination of clomiphene and metformin are better. Letrozole leads to higher live birth rate, and it has less multiple pregnancy rate. And compared to clomiphene, letrozole is the only treatment showing a significant higher live birth rate. I'm not going to go through this. Very quickly about stair step protocol for ovulation induction. Essentially, you give 50 milligram of clomiphene, scan her. There's no follicle, thin endometrium, you can immediately give her 100 milligram for five days. Scan her again. No follicle, still thin endometrium, give 150. That is the stair step protocol. And this study looked at stair step protocol versus traditional protocol. And they, show, they have shown that time to ovulation is decreased because within one cycle, you're going boom, 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 and you're done. Either she ovulates or you move on to the next step. Ovulation rates were increased in stair step. Pregnancy rates were similar once ovulation was achieved. So the stair step protocol is associated with decreased time to ovulation and increased ovulation rate at higher doses when compared with the traditional protocol. So if you're still doing clomiphene, you might as well think towards this. Clomiphene citrate, we know the physiology behind it, so I'm going to skip this. We know it is anti-estrogenic on uterus and cervix, and that is why you get thin endometrium. Um, cervical mucus is a little bit more conflicting data, but it is, it's supposed to have a detrimental effect. It has side effects. It has a risk of hyperstimulation, multiple pregnancy, we are not allowed to do more than 12 cycles because of borderline tumors. And then, of course, you have clomiphene resistant and failure patients. The letrozole blocks conversion of testosterone to estrogen and thereby releases gonadotropin secretion. It has no anti estrogenic effect on endometrium, but we have a problem. Risk of congenital malformation and chromosomal abnormalities has been suggested. And it is still a category X in off license preparation as an OI agent. And the guidelines are that until aromatase inhibitors have been approved for ovulation induction by government, they should, they should be used with caution and should be carefully counseled. And that puts off many clinicians, at least a third of them feel very uncomfortable to prescribe letrozole. So with this background, we undertook the systematic review, which is accepted in human reproduction update and hopefully will be published soon. It was a big collaboration. And we simply wanted to see whether the use of letrozole is associated with harm in terms of congenital malformation and pregnancy loss. We thought pregnancy loss is important to add because maybe who are, if there were fatal congenital malformation, they were resulting into pregnancy loss. It was a systematic review with a very, very strict protocol and we compared that we, we looked for anything which was available in literature, which reported on newborns delivered following the use of letrozole, and they mentioned any congenital malformation. I collected every kind of trials, every type of studies, every cohort study, case report, everything. And we ended up with 46 um, papers 
out of which 35 could be included into meta-analysis, 17 were randomized trials and 18 were non-randomized cohort studies. So there were almost 5,000 newborns out of these 46 studies. Latrozole is used for ovulation induction with or without IUI, ART cycles, both fresh and FET cycles, and one study even used it in endometriosis. It is compared in ovulation induction cycles with clomiphene mainly, 28 studies, and natural conception gonadotropin, etc. I'm going to skip these because uh, and I'm running out of time, I guess. Um, but one slide <laughs> which looked at clomiphene versus latrozole from randomized control trial found no difference in the risk of congenital malformation. But we had to reduce the grade of the data because the data was very sparse. So we had to downgrade it as moderate quality rather than high quality. And as soon as you say it is moderate quality, that means further research is likely to have important impact. However, these are very, very scare, very, very um, rare events. So how much more can you wait? So to address that, we looked at fragility index, which is essentially tells you that how many more numbers you need and how many they need to be switched. So more in chromophene or less in letrozole to make your non-significant to significant and higher the number, the better is your data. And we found that our fragility index was 44%. So seven change in events, that is either four extra in letrozole or three less in promethine are needed to make the association as significant. So because this number is high, it gives us an additional confidence in our data. I'm going to slip all the slides on letrozole, but this is all other natural conception, gonadotropin, everything, there was no difference. And same was the pregnancy loss. So finally, 4,614 babies, 95 babies born with congenital malformation, that is 2%, 32, 1.6% born with major congenital malformation, and 12 babies, that is 0.06% born with major cardiac abnormalities. So the paper has the details of every single malformations reported in the literature. So to conclude, there's no increased evidence risk of malformation or increased risk of pregnancy loss due to use of letrozole as a fertility agent. This is consistent independently of comparators used, such as clomiphene, natural conception, or gonadotropin, different types of treatment used, rather ovulation induction or ART, or the study design, such as RCTs or not. The overall risk is 2.06%, and major risk is 1.6%. And we hope that the results from our study will facilitate international bodies to reconsider the classification category of letrozole as a fertility agent, letting us to move forward with this important drug which can help in this group of women. Metformin, it has the role in OI, which I already touched based on the current guidelines, but it also has a role in ART, which I will come to next. Gonadotropins can be used as a first line if you can afford the cost and you can do the scan and you can take the risk of multiple pregnancy. Otherwise, it is considered as a second line agent. And it should be used in preference to combination if you want in a resistance women. But we have to think about the cost, expertise, etc., And very, very careful about the risk of multiple pregnancy. Anti-obesity drugs are still considered as under the research context. Laparoscopic ovarian diathermy, again, we all know that Procrine review has shown that there's no difference in the birth rates, but it reduces multiple pregnancy rate. It may be an adjuvant to clomiphene or gonadotrophins, but there are risks suggested as risk of adhesions and ovarian function are at the moment unclear. It can be used as a second line, or you can offer it as a first line if you're already doing laparoscopy for another reason. Again, you have to consider the risks, cost, laparoscopy in obese women are increased risk, etc. Bariatric surgery still should be considered under research context because it has got lots of issues to consider, both in terms of surgery, pregnancy, and the pregnancy monitoring. Finally, the fourth step is ART. You have to think of the cost and the risk of OHSS. Any FSH can be used, no need to add extra LH. If you're using antagonist protocol, it is preferred because it has shown that it has less risk of OHSS. 
you might as well trigger with gonadotropin uh, GnRH agonist and think about freezing all the embryos. You may also want to think adding metformin. If you're using GnRH agonist protocol, use the lowest dose possible for SCG trigger. Use adjoint MET, that is metformin, as it is shown to reduce the risk of OHSS. Of course, in vitro maturation is still there, and if you're good at it, you might worth consider using this. Thank you for your attention, and sorry for going over my time. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation, and uh, I was just listening like a student sitting here in India. And uh, you have gone through all the pharmacological drugs, their advantages and meta-analysis, starting from clomiphene citrate, then letrozole, then uh, ionocetol, and also a lot of research you are doing. I found one of my uh, classmates named Dr. Priya Bide in one of your uh, uh, research project. So, so it's very nice to hear a lot of work you are doing. And we have got few questions. So I will just ask one or two questions and then we will go to Madam uh, Reshma Pai. Uh, this is uh, from uh, Dr. Arthi Deepak Kovil Patti. I think this sounds to be in South, in South India. What's the best protocol in ovarian stimulation for patients with PCOS, ma'am? Currently, the, the body of thought is to go ahead with antagonist protocol, freeze all the embryos. So that is going to minimize your risk of OHSS and then bring her back for a, a frozen embryo cycle. And you, it needs to be a HRT cycle because generally they don't have uh, ovulatory cycles. Uh, but that is the way forward at the moment. Okay. And uh, there is one question from Dr. Sutha Chennai. Which protocol will you follow in FET cycle? Just HRT or HRT with agonist down regulation. The next question is, is there any individualized protocol for a particular subgroup? Uh, okay. The second question is a bit dodgy. I'll come to it. So first and foremost, frozen embryo transfer cycle. Um, if you want uh, GNRH down regulation, because they have got a really prolonged cycle, so you don't know where you stand, you might have to start follicular down regulation. The second option is that you can do modified in which you don't use the GNRH down regulation. Uh, you bring the patient, check the endometrium, and start straight with estradiol. So you can use either of them, and you can, as long as endometrium thickness reaches to 8 millimeter plus, you can then proceed with embryo transfer. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Randomly, you don't have to start even follicular. Say, for example, you see her day 20, you do a scan. Endometrium is still very thin. There's no follicular recruitment. You can start her on Bucerlin, or you can start straight with estradiol. So, you know, as long as you've done a scan and you make sure there's no follicular recruitment and endometrium is very thin, that means she hasn't really got much estrogen exposing. There's no follicle messing around. So you can do that. And then third option is quite a lot of people are even um, adding antagonists later on in the cycle. But we don't really do uh, antagonist if there's any follicular um, recruitment. We generally go with the first two options. Thank you, madam. So nice of you. It was a pleasure hearing. We will get back to you soon. Okay. And we will also involve you in our uh, courses. TOG, this is the TOG benchmark report. And we have conducted more than 90 webinars starting from the lockdown period in April, May, June, July, and now we are in August. 88% have registered to attend, and the registrant to attendee conversion is 88%. And you can also see the further pie chart, and it tells us how they have registered in the week of live webinar, that is 94%. And more than a week before live webinar, that is 6%. Can we have the next slide, please? And this is the viewing time. 51 minutes is the average viewer time. And that's amazing. And the login curve, they are from 2,500 to 3,600 users who log in. And I want to tell you, we get... 
uh, you know users not only from india pan india but from southeast asia europe transatlantic and it's amazing to even get from south american countries so today we have a european speaker with us from live from uk thank you so much madam we will come back to you thank now you. i call upon our president of mumbai obstetrics and gynecological society to talk on our topic of poor responders i want to tell you one thing dr reshma pai looks very cool and very uh, soft spoken very light she has a good hold on english but i'll tell you she is a dynamite behind this now we are in a lockdown period and since mogs she has taken over the president every weekend every saturday sunday we have amazing programs we are very fortunate to have you madam that uh, in the lockdown period now we are in unlock period so it is amazing to hear from you you have been doing a wonderful job and i want to tell you today more than 700 people have logged in right now and we are having live users to hear your talk we have already introduced you so not wasting much time madam i hand over the mic to you for your wonderful lecture to hear thank you so much madam i request you to please unmute your mic you will have to do from your side yes madam thank you thank you ranjan i'm just going to take a minute to organize my slide show i think it's um i need to <clears throat> The screen is too big i need to minimize it a little bit sorry uh, can somebody help me with that yes madam we can see you can the make it is a little too big i need to just uh, adjust it to size and i'm not able to find that uh double can you help i just because you know the screen is a little too big so it's not fitting into it it is perfectly visible sorry please make it full screen yeah i will make it full screen but uh, just by that is it okay now all right yeah, it is oh, perfectly visible yes but fine enough thank you uh thank you um lovely to meet uh, jyotsna So dear friend from the UK, and um, uh, normally we meet at least once a year, if not more. Unfortunately, this year we've stayed away from the UK for a long period of time. So, thank you for joining us and giving us that uh, wonderful, uh, personally researched uh, uh, information, and that was very, very uh, interesting. So, thank you for that, and uh, Niranjan, as usual, you, energetic and bright. and i'm going to take you to the other side of the spectrum so jyotsna spoke about the over or the hyper responders and we are going to go to the other end of the spectrum to the poor responders and how we are really going to overcome obstacles in this extremely difficult uh, situation uh, when the whole world says give up but then all we have to fall back upon is hope and hope says please try it one more time and these patients who are poor responders who do not respond to your special treatment who are older who may be 38 40 42 years old all they rely on is hope in many many situations and really once you choose hope everything is possible and in these patients we have to offer them a solution because all of us know today ladies are getting married at a much later date they are planning to have children much later not only that even in the younger population today we are seeing that there is poor ovarian reserve for some reason they are heading towards a little bit earlier menopause <clears throat> so all of us know that this premature ovarian insufficiency is a very complex poorly understood ent uh, entity many different etiologies and there are multi systems equally that stem from basically the premature deprivation 
of the ovarian sex hormones. And so many different ways people describe this problem, premature ovarian insufficiency, poor responders, diminished ovarian reserve, premature ovarian aging, all of them really are applicable terms. And we all know that today in IVF, in ART, so much advance has been made. But even today, one of the fundamental steps to reach success is related to the number of eggs. So if you don't have eggs, like in poor responders, you're going to have less embryos. And obviously, you're going to have a significantly lower pregnancy rate. And so even though we know since many, many years about poor responders, we have not had a good definition of poor responders up to very recently. So the incidence of poor responders is as high as maybe 24% in IVF cycles and obviously gives us extremely poor pregnancy outcomes. In this group of patients specifically, individualized treatment has to be done. And normally we tell our patients, you know, if you stay with us, you have an excellent chance of pregnancy. If she's younger than 35, we can say you have an 80% chance of a live birth rate. And as they grow older, our prognosis becomes worse and worse. And then we tell the girl who's more than 40, this lady, we tell her that your chance of having a live baby is only about 26%. So you can see the massive decline in pregnancy outcomes with advancing age. So what are the common causes of ovarian reserve? Of course, there's a physiological decline of follicular heritage, massively declining after the age of 37 or 38 years. But in poor responders, sometimes it could be that there is no obvious reason. There is a mechanism of ovarian insufficiency, which is prematurely determined, may not be fully understood. Some reasons are obvious to us. If this lady's had a surgery for endometriomas, particularly bilateral endometriomas, if she's had some chemo or radiotherapy, if she's a chronic smoker, uh, if she's a bad diabetic, she's had uterine artery embolization. So even a simple history will give us this background and then we immediately know that we can expect a poor responder. But what are the tests available to us to confirm this diagnosis? And then I said, many patients, they are normally young. You'll see in practice today, a normal 30-year-old lady walks in and you, uh, you know, start investing her, investigating her and you find that the AMH and the AFC is very, very less. So what are the important ovarian reserve markers? The most important thing is the age because age is the only thing which actually correlates with the clinical pregnancy outcome, the egg number, the number of embryos you're going to get all are correlated with age whereas if you do an amh anti malarian hormone test or you do an antral follicle count on day two or day three all of them are correlated with the egg number the number of embryos but not actually with the pregnancy outcome so compared to all your egg uh, ovarian reserve markers age is the most important then of course is your uh, anti malarian hormone antral follicle count etc so you know, the management of poor ovarian, response, uh, poor ovarian responders is really very, very challenging. And you can see that for years this has been going on. Up until a few years ago, there were 41 different definitions of poor responders in 47 different uh, controlled trials. And everybody was confused. What is this poor responder? How do you even define it? And there was so much confusion that people were like, is there really any light at the end? of this tunnel for these poor patients who are poor ovarian responders. So finally, after so much of confusion in 2011, the European Society of Human Reproduction actually came out with a criteria for diagnosing or for defining poor ovarian response, which is the Bologna criteria. So any patient, any of your patients who have at least two out of these three will be called a poor responder. And this is either she ha you have tried stimulation and she's had a previous poor response, or you do her test AMH less than 1.1 ng per ml, uh, AFC five or seven follicles or lesser. And of course, if the woman is more than 40 years old, which by itself is enough to tell you that she will be a poor responder.
despite this, it's been there for many years, this criteria now, despite this, lot of criticism about it, because eventually the criteria did not adequately take the age-related impact on oocyte quality into consideration. You know, the confusion existed about real poor ovarian response and the cause of the ovarian response. Like a particular patient may have an FSH a receptor or an LX receptor polymorphism. So she's good, but you're giving her a less dose and that's why she's not responding. That doesn't make her a poor responder. So there was no recommendation that if her uh, if she's a poor responder, how should you treat that patient? So because of all these, uh, you know, sort of uh, lacunae or gaps, this particular criteria did undergo a lot of criticism. And so a couple of years later, in 2016, the Poseidon criteria were brought in. These are the patient-oriented strategies encompassing individualized oocyte number. That's what Poseidon stands for. And these actually was much more detailed classification of poor responders. They actually divided these patients into four groups and started giving you, uh, you know, within the poor responder subgroups and within them how to treat them. So you can see group one. In group two are patients who are actually having a normal AMH test, normal antiphotical count. Group one is young patients, but with a normal count, but they don't respond. Group two is older patients, 35 and more, normal reports, but when you actually start stimulation, they don't respond. The actual poor responders are group three and four. Group three is poor, uh, uh, you know, AMH, low AFC, and patient is young. And group four is the real problem cases, 35 years and more in age, poor ovarian reserve parameters, low AMH, low AFC. So this actually categorizes even the just the poor responders into four different categories. So now we have to individualize our stimulation protocols, and that is extremely important. And we can do it based on the Poseidon uh, management. So like I told you, the real poor, poor responders are the young patients, but who have low AMH, AFC, and the older patients who have low AMH and AFC and various recommendations for treatments have been given. But one point I want to bring out in this very dull chart, of course, and that is that in the young girls, less than 35, but with a low AMH AFC, you need an average of four to seven eggs to create one blastocyst. So, so many eggs are needed to get just one good day five embryo, which you can implant. Whereas in the older age group, you need about 12 eggs to get one blastocyst. So, you know, your patient is very happy. You've done her egg pickup. She's got seven eggs and she's like, oh, I'm going to get seven embryos and I'm going to have a baby for sure. But you have to tell her that one seven eggs may mean only one good quality embryo. So that is how you have to give uh, the prognosis to these patients. A lot of people for many years have believed that in poor responders, anyway, you're going to get maybe one egg or two eggs. Why give stimulation? Why not do a natural cycle? And many studies have been done about this, that with natural cycle, just letting that natural egg grow, the live birth rate is only 2%. Too low to be acceptable. But when you give this poor responder stimulation, 300 units at least, she has a live birth rate of 11%. So it's still a low birth rate, but much, much better than natural cycle. So natural cycle, very, very few people are doing it. <clears throat> What about mild stimulation? And there are many, many proponents of mild stimulation. Over the years, um, Mild stimulation has been studied. And this very, 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 very recent study come out, in fact, uh, earlier this month. So it's literally one week old, the study by Datta and Gita Nargon from the UK itself. And they have studied, uh, you know, that if you give low dose gonadotropins, less than 150 units alone or with uh, letrozole or CC, and you, or you, and you compare it with a much higher dose, 300, 450 units of gonadotropins, there was no difference in the live birth rate. You got little lesser eggs and embryos, but eventually live birth rate was the same. The cost was much lesser, the problems were much lesser. And so they found that mild IVF strategy in poor responders is fairly better, equal results, but much less expensive than the conventional IVF. So uh, this was important. Again, I'm bringing to you some new concepts and ideas. Again, this is a very, very recent study, uh, just two months old, which talks about follicular output rate 
and the follicular to oocyte index. This is to tell us that just because you see some follicles on a baseline scan, that doesn't mean you're going to get all of them growing and giving us eggs and becoming embryos. So the follicular output rate is the pre-ovulatory follicle count on the day of the HCG divided by the antral follicle count. And the follicle to oocyte index is the number of oocytes retrieved at the time of the pickup, again, divided by the basic antral follicle count you have done. <clears throat> This helps us determine ovarian sensitivity. And what this study concludes is that patients who have poor ovarian sensitivity, which is basically the patients who are older with a ovarian reserve, which is quite good, this group you will be adjusting. You will prefer to recommend an adjustment to the protocol. The entire protocol of ovarian stimulation should be changed. While those who have normal ovarian sensitivity, young girls but with poor ovarian reserve, step up the dose. Just changing the dose will help. So this is becoming more and more individualized, the treatment using all these protocols and parameters. Most of us have a tendency that the patient has an AMH of 0.5. She's a very poor responder. She's 40 years old. Let's give her massive amounts of gonadotropins. And I myself have seen reports coming in from other doctors giving 900 units of gonadotropins per day, which is completely shocking. So these studies are just brought out to tell you that there are only that many eggs. You can't flog a dying horse. The eggs are less. Whether you give her uh, 300 units or you give her 3,000 units, the eggs are not going to be produced out of nowhere. So the recommendation is that limit the gonadotropin dose. And in fact, the Cochrane review has limited it a lot. And I'm not sure I follow this. They have said that the evidence does not provide justification for adjusting the standard uh, dose of 150 units only, whether she's a normal responder or a poor responder. But in our practice, we tend to go up to 300 units of gonadotropins. And I think most people tend to follow that rather than 150 units only. Most people, again, for poor responders, follow the GNRH antagonist protocol. However, this study by Sunkara, again, a very, very smart lady from South of India now practicing in the UK, she came up with a study that the long GNRH agonist protocol increased the number of eggs uh, and oocytes by one. So one extra egg you got if you gave the long GNRH down regulation because it caused good follicular synchronization. And if one extra egg is obtained, the live birth rate of that patient increases by 5%. And so this particular study recommended that if you use a long GNRH analog down regulation in a girl, for example, who's 35 to 37 year old, her pregnancy rate will increase from 13 to 18%, which is a good increase. And so again, a lot of thought process on using long, uh, long down regulation again in these patients. Though, of course, most of us still continue to use antagonist protocol. Some people in poor responders like to use the GNRH agonist microdose protocol, where small doses of GNRH agonist, 20, 50 micrograms are given daily right at the beginning of the cycle, just for two, three days. It helps you to increase your FSH LH and, uh, you know, uh, increases the number of eggs possibly. So GNRH analog protocol. And many people use a combination of clomiphene or letrozole along with gonadotropins in poor responders. We do that all the time. But the Cochrane review recently was not that favorable. They said definitely the number or the dose of gonadotropin will become less if you use uh, letrozole in these cycles. But they were not sure about the um, <clears throat> outcome. Finally, they said there may be an increase in the number of cycle cancellations and the number of eggs removed. But many of us have a slightly different opinion. And in fact, again, a recent study came out which said that when you use letrozole along with gonadotropins in an antagonist protocol, you actually got the number of eggs which were retrieved were much higher. The dose of gonadotropins, the duration of stimulation was lesser and the pregnancy rate was higher. 25% when you use letrozole with gonadotropin compared to the control, which is only 18%. So many studies, again, a little bit uh, conflicting uh, regarding the use of uh, letrozole or clomiphene, but most of us prefer to use that because otherwise the dose of gonadotropins goes high and the costs go up a lot. Another very popular thing with uh, poor responders is keeping on giving them cocktails of drugs with the hope of increasing their uh, output of eggs. 
So these adjuvants are really a lot of different pharmacological agents being tried to improve the outcome of IVF treatment. Growth hormone is one such on which a lot of focus was given. Many studies said growth hormone really works and it's been going back and forth. But this latest study now, which has come out last month, again, in fertility sterility with 12 randomized trials, said that the growth hormone supplementation did not show an increase in the live birth rate. There was increased clinical pregnancy, egg number, oocytes, etc. were a little higher. But at the end of the day, the live birth rate did not improve. So growth hormone, many of us still use because unfortunately don't have any magic therapies, but 100% um, benefit is yet to be confirmed. Again, testosterone uh, seems to have some kind of a role to play. And if you're using a testosterone gel, uh, uh, may help improve responses in these patients. DHEAS is another agent used a lot. And DHEA supplementation helped produce a greater number of top quality embryos. It actually reduced the DNA damage. The benefits of DHEA supplementation on IVF outcomes were significant. And this may be by improving mitochondrial function. So DHEA definitely has a role to play in poor responders. What about giving LH supplementation? Again, has been very, very controversial. There have been studies in the past which said that LH improved pregnancy rate. And then this really large, the largest study came in from Humayden in 2017. And when they actually analyzed poor responders, they found that there was no significant difference whether you added LH or not. But when they went into the details of that study, they found that patients with moderate to severe, means quite bad uh, response, very severe ovarian uh, uh, low reserve, these people actually benefited with LH addition. So LH definitely for poor responders may have a role to play. And, uh, you know, this very, again, earlier this year, this um, uh, big review came out and meta-analysis uh, and they compared 10 different adjuvants because like I told you, people give a cocktail of drugs. They compared testosterone, DHEA, letrozole, recombinant, LH, growth hormone, uh, you know, coenzyme, everything was compared. And it was found that compared to control uh, patients, DHEA, coenzyme Q10, they did give a higher chance of clinical pregnancy. And uh, some amount of help from growth hormone, HCG, estradiol was obtained. So growth hormone, coenzyme Q10, DHEA may have a role to play in improving outcomes in these patients. So we have to constantly tell our patients, we tried, sorry, it didn't work. Don't be discouraged. It's often the last key in the bunch that opens the lock. So in these very difficult patients, we have to try and we have to keep manipulating our results. So what are the modifications that we can do to improve outcomes? These are some different protocols. Some of you may be familiar with them, may not be. These are all pretty new stuff. One is the effect of progestin primed ovarian stimulation protocols in these poor responders. So what is done here, it was found that in these progestin primed ovarian stimulation protocols, the oocyte utilization rate, quality of the embryos was much higher than otherwise. Pregnancy rate, 22% compared to 12% in the control cycles. So in patients who are uh, poor responders, older patients, you may want to try progesterone primed ovarian stimulation. And just to give you a little bit of information about what this is, you start your gonadotropins as usual on day two or three, and then you start your antagonist uh, 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 as uh, is being done. And this particular protocol was compared with instead of antagonist, the patient was started on medroxyprogesterone acetate when the egg reached 14. So you start gonadotropins, instead of antagonist, you start her on uh, uh, progesterone when the egg is 13 or 14 millimeters in size and so you can avoid the antagonist completely so cost comes down injection comes down and it was found that the egg number the egg quality the pregnancy outcomes were very very similar there was an odd case of uh, premature uh, ovulation in some patients if you don't give antagonist but overall the results were very very uh, sort of uh, convincing and encouraging. So progestin, uh, you know, uh, using flexible progestin primed ovarian stimulation protocol may be an option. 
another interesting uh, protocol that is being used you prime these patients with estrogen so uh, before their menstruation put them on estrogen for a few days when they get menstruation start them on gnrh antagonist immediately this will help bring down the fsh prevent premature luteinization synchronize the follicles and then you start your stimulation with gonadotropins on maybe the 7th or 8th day of the periods then the eggs start to grow once the eggs are 13 or 14 again you start your antagonist and this way there is follicular follicles which are synchronous there's no premature uh, luteinization and you actually get really good outcome so this is the luteal estrogen administration and early follicular gonadotropin releasing uh, horm uh, hormone antagonist priming so this is another protocol which you can use another thing that is being done and this now is quite common and we've been doing it now for a while and that is the luteal phase ovarian stimulation which is double stimulation so normally you get a period you start stimulation so that's your follicular st phase stimulation but you can also add to that luteal phase stimulation in the same cycle and this double stimulation that means two times in a month you're stimulating the patient using um, gonadotropins along with letrozole usually and so you start day two start giving her gonadotropins give her antagonist give her trigger remove her eggs so typically around 13 14 days you've taken the eggs out after that after a one day gap you start the stimulation again and again you give her the same protocol and again you remove her eggs twice in month and it has been found that double the number of eggs can be given uh, obtained in these patients so remember these are old patients maybe 40 years old that uh, the eggs number is dwindling rapidly and if you delay her too much wait for one month two months to do another cycle we may be losing a lot of eggs and for this particular protocol many many studies have come in again you can see a fertility sterility study earlier this year which says that duostim duostim or double stimulation is really giving you cumulative live birth rate uh, from 7% with your conventional stimulation to 15% so doubling of the pregnancy rate uh, the cumulative live birth rate is very good and plus within a short time you have the patient captured with you she doesn't run away you get good number of eggs and you can help her achieve pregnancy another simple thing you can do is do a dual trigger of course when the egg is ready all of us give hcg to trigger along with the hcg you can give a small dose 0.1 mg of gnrh hormone agonist so that will give you what we call a double trigger and that is supposed to give you a significantly high number of eggs mature good eggs and improving the pregnancy outcomes another recommendation for this patient is what we call highly individualized egg retrieval normally for all our patients we do standard retrieval when the egg is 18 to 20 we remove it from the ovary but in poor responders it is recommended that you can do an early retrieval when the eggs are 16 to 18 you can get those eggs out and they will give you a much higher pregnancy rate uh, uh, so around 16% compared to standard retrieval only 6% so these patients you may want to get the egg out early and get better outcomes so every aspect has been looked at how to improve pregnancy in these patients because they are very difficult patients with very very few eggs so highly individualized egg retrieval at the um, size of 16 to 18 gives better outcomes most of us over the years when you have only two and three eggs we take that egg out we put a flushing medium we flush it once twice to try to make sure that at least those two three eggs we get every single one of them out but it has been shown that follicular flushing is time consuming and has similar results compared with direct aspiration so maybe there is no scientific reason to do flushing of the follicles even in poor responders again most people tend to do uh, icsi cycle rather than ivf even there is even though there is no obvious reason for it because we have very few eggs we don't want to have non fertilized egg and so we pick up and we do a icsi cycle in every single patient however evidence for this is limited we all tend to whether uh, we should do the transfer on day 2 or day 3 again has been a subject of debate many years it was believed that you should do a day 2 transfer in poor responders but now it has been seen that there is not much change uh, when you do on day 2 or day 3 
the transfer. So similar outcomes. Uh, what about the eggs, number of embryos for transferring? And this, I think, is really not debatable. ASRM, the American Society, has given pretty standard guidelines that uh, you put two embryos uh, if the girl is less than 35 years of age, up to three embryos in women who are 35 to 38. And if the lady is older than 41, those are the only conditions in which you are allowed to put up to four embryos. Of course, most of the world has switched to single embryo transfer or single blastocyst transfer except in the older <laughs> uh, site uh, cryopreservation and pooling most of us again tend to follow this if the lady has only one or two eggs we take out her eggs again we, we freeze them again we call her back again we take out eggs we freeze them so we create a pool of embryos and once we have a pool then we put them back slowly slowly and we believe that the pregnancy outcomes will be better this again has not been proven though most of the people prefer to do egg uh, oocyte pooling <laughs> so eventually we all come down if everything else fails i've given you so many different strategies to try but if none of these strategies work eventually we will have to go to egg donation so we always have uh, every ivf center has an egg bank or they get up from an outside commercial bank and you get a young patient's donor egg and of course have fabulous chances of pregnancy but i truly believe that most people want to have their own baby how easy is it to accept that you know uh, i'm a educated intelligent person but i'm going to take an egg from some uh, you know maybe poor uneducated uh, you know illiterate background person so most people prefer to try their own egg how much ever uh, they can <clears throat> And then what we can do, and this is quite practical a tip, that you tell the patient, okay, we're going to try to get your eggs. They're going to start your stimulation, try to get your eggs. If halfway through we find that you have not responded, then in that same cycle, we have taken your consent to do a donor cycle. Uh, so we tried her eggs and then she's also convinced that, yeah, we tried everything. It is not possible. And there itself, we can start, um, uh, you know, we can uh, uh, go and convert her to a donor cycle right away. So very quickly, I'll run you through a survey which was done on poor responders. Uh, more than 125,000 cycles, over almost 200 centers all over the world were considered. And the survey told us that what is the common percentage of poor responders? Most clinics said 6 to 15%. Uh, and has the incidence increased? Almost 67%. Yes, we are seeing much more poor responders in our clinics. And if even if that patient doesn't get eggs, will you repeat the cycle? Most of the doctors said, yes, at least one more time, we will try. The protocol that was most commonly used, majority of the doctors prefer to use GNRH antagonist protocol. Whether they preferred FSH or HMG, again, HMG, combination of FSH and LH, was the preferred um, combination of gonadotropins. And then, uh, do they use clomiphene? Many of them said no. Do you add growth hormones? Most of them said no. Aspirin, low molecular weight, most people did not use any of these additions. So the last part of my talk really is about the future, because I really believe that learning and innovation go hand in hand. And the arrogance of success is to think that what you did yesterday will be sufficient for tomorrow. So 10 years ago, I did this and it worked well for me is not going to work tomorrow. Unfortunately for us, a lot of new things have come in for this patient who's the most challenging patient in IVF. That is the patient who's a poor responder. So what are the new things that are coming up? One thing, which is, I think, not that new anymore because all of us are now practicing, and that is the injection of platelet-rich plasma into the ovary. Many, many centers have now started doing this. So platelet-rich plasma is taken from the patient, activated with calcium gluconate. 5 ml is injected into each ovary transvaginally. This can be done as an outpatient procedure. And it was found that there was an increase in AMH, FSH reduced, eggs were produced in patients who otherwise had no eggs at all. So there's a possibility that this technique might help. And here it's a very uh, like a small study uh, and how this actually works. And uh, um, so again, study came out just in June of this year, which said that the 
tissue repair properties, particularly the angiogenic effects of platelet rich plasma, may be the reason behind its benefit. When you actually inject the PRP, there can be increase in cellular oxygenation, reduction in the reactive oxygen species, increased angiogenesis, improved follicular perfusion, and actually even uh, normal. Uh, reduced um, abnormal eggs and embryos. So many benefits of injection of PRP. And this study again, just three poor responder patients. This I put to show you that the FSH decreased by 67% and AMH increased by 75% in patients with injection of this PRP. And patients went on sometimes to even have a natural conception. Another thing sort of along the similar lines is the use of stem cell ovarian transplantation. So autologous stem cell ovarian transplant, that is the ASCOT, where stem cells were generated from the patient and injected into the uh, ovary showed an ovarian function improvement of 81%. So again, natural pregnancies in patients who were just not becoming pregnant with the use of stem cells, there was a lot of improvement. Um, we have tried actually to master this technique, extremely difficult though, um, you know, Rishikesh went a couple of years ago, did training in this, and that is the in vitro activation. Technique is simple, but, uh, you know, many different steps involved and how beneficial it will be. And, uh, you know, it was very uh, interesting, uh, this particular study which came out, which got us all interested. These are patients who were already in nervous. The FSH was 35. And these patients, uh, obviously, like four months of amenorrhea already. So they had no chance of becoming pregnant. In these patients, laparoscopy egg was removed, fragmented and frozen. Whenever we wanted to put them back, these fragmented pieces were removed, chopped into smaller pieces. They were cultured with uh, protein kinase stimulators for two days, washed, and laparoscopy inserted back under the tube, beneath the serosa of the fallopian tube. And remember, in these menopausal patients, it was seen that in just a short period of time, they started growing eggs, and three out of four preg uh, pregnancies uh, achieved and uh, natural pregnancies were also achieved. So this was pretty crazy that menopausal FSH 35 patients with in vitro activation could become pregnant again. Another thing which is becoming very, very popular, lots and lots of papers on it, is the mitochondrial and autologous germline mitochondrial energy. All of us know that Aging, old oocytes have reduced number of mitochondria. Mitochondria are basically the energy factories. And if there is less mitochondria, you could have poor fertilization rates and poor embryo development outcomes. So if we can take the patient's own mitochondria and transplant it into the oocytes, it would become edgy and would have better outcomes. And this augment technique has been tried in a couple of centers. Mitochondria has been isolated from the woman's own ovarian stem cells. And these are injected along with the sperm into the oocyte. And you can see how this is done. The small biopsy from the ovary is taken. Her, um, the mitochondrial precursor cells are uh, removed. They are uh, actually isolated. And then the mitochondria from these precursor cells along with the sperm is injected into the egg during ICSI. And it was found that patients who were just not becoming pregnant started becoming pregnant with a success rate of 25 to 40%. And this is a very nice study from, you know, three centers are now doing it regularly. And this is data from two centers that the pregnancy rates uh, initially were uh, only 5% or 1%. And after doing this augment technique, they produced a pregnancy rate of 35% and 22%. So amazing improvements in the outcome with augment technique. Uh, there is hope for all these women because we do believe that there are ovarian germline stem cells just underneath the germinal epithelium. So obviously if you have stem cells in the ovary, they can be a permanent source of eggs. Imagine if we could have eggs all throughout the life of a woman, uh, how her hormones, how her endocrine status, how her fertility would be beneficial. And I'm just going to end with these uh, two, three slides, uh, which are very, very dramatic uh, announcements that scientists grow human eggs to full maturity in a lab. 
And this was all over the newspapers uh, two years ago when they said they would actually grow human eggs outside the body from the earlier stage to full maturity. And how useful this would be, say, in cancer patients who are under undergoing chemotherapy, etc. You can actually grow their eggs uh, from literally the earlier stage to full embryo uh, development. Again, in the Ashrik conference two years ago, this was announced that they can actually create an artificial ovary. And we know that there are women, for example, who have ovarian cancer. Their uh, ovaries are already seeded with cancer cells. You cannot freeze their ovaries. Otherwise, we can freeze an ovary. And we are doing it now for pre-cancer uh, patients before they undergo chemotherapy. So in these kind of patients in this study, they actually created a scaffolding into which they could actually uh, create an artificial ovary. And this could help restore a woman's fertility using their eggs and maybe donor tissue. So of course, these are very uh, futuristic thoughts. At this particular um, um, uh, report, when it came out, they said that this work could develop into an artificial ovary in five or 10 years. So probably in the next few years, we will be able to offer our patients, especially those undergoing chemotherapy, an artificial ovary. So to conclude, poor responders definitely have very poor clinical outcomes, poor live birth rates, etc. Gonadotropin dose, just by increasing it, you cannot increase egg number. Uh, long GNRH analog uh, protocols, microdose, antagonists, all of these protocols seem to have a role to play. Whether you transfer eggs on day two or day three, not too much of a difference. Embryo pooling may, may not have a role to play. Some adjuvants such as DHEs, uh, growth hormone, coenzyme, Q10 may have some role to play. We are not sure. Using letrozole in your stimulation protocols does seem to help. Uh, eventually, like I said, oocyte donation is uh, what everybody resorts to if all else fails. But in the future, technologies such as platelet-rich plasma injections, stem cells, in vitro activation, augment technique may have an important role to play. So I always like to say that the more I live, the more I learn, and the more I learn, the more I realize, the less I know. There is so little that we know, so much more to learn. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam. You are not only the epitome of beauty, grace, and elegance, but also knowledge and intelligence. Amazing lecture on poor responders, and the way you have described all the protocols, especially the newer progesterone stimulation protocols. And I really liked also the long GNRH agonist protocols, transfer of day to embryo, embryo pooling. And last few slides were the recent advances which you shared with us, the papers which have been seen in ASHRAE and in Human Reproduction 2018. 2020 and artificial ovaries which were being made in London in February 2020, uh, 2018 and a lot of uh, things you have madam told about poor responders we are very thankful to you I want to tell now we have got users 800 users who have logged in and uh, there are questions which I want to ask you before I go to Dr. Jotsna Pundit, and these are regarding poor responders. Uh, Dr. Reshma Pai, before that, uh, there are some excellent comments which have come from Haridwar, from North India, Kanpur, from Nasik. There is Dr. Varsha Lahade. She has said that it is a nice and clear information from Haridwar. Dr. Sonu Raut, excellent presentation, especially on ovarian stimulation, poor responders. Glad to see you after a long time. Thank you, madam. Dr. Alka Kute has also said from Amravati, wonderful, excellent lecture by dear Reshma, enriched with new advances in this field. And uh, we have got also questions from Qatar. Dr. Sanjay Prabhu, he has joined us. Madam uh, Dr. Reshma Pai, he wants to ask you a question. I am repeating it. Any suggestion with respect to duo stim protocols in poor responders? Of all the protocols mentioned, how do you individualize for a patient? Madam, your take on this. 
So dual uh, stimulation or two stimulations in one cycle has now become fairly standardized. We are already practicing it since a period of time. So essentially, there is really no change in your normal stimulation. We often start with, for example, letrozole uh, along with gonadotropins on day two or three. Do your normal stimulation with about 300 units of gonadotropins. Uh, we start the antagonist when the egg is 13 or 14, and we give the trigger uh, with the uh, analog, and we retrieve the eggs um, as per schedule. Once the eggs are retrieved, maybe you'll have two eggs, one egg, three eggs, because these are poor responder patients. One day gap, next day you can start stimulation again. The same exact same protocol you can follow. So what happens is, first of all, you save a lot of time. Secondly, you know, when the patient has one and two eggs, they will leave you, they'll go away, they'll go to some other doctor, they'll try to do that. Here you can actually retain your patients in the same time span of one month. You can get double the number of eggs and your possibility, like I said, the rate limiting factor is eggs. So if you get more eggs, there's a possibility of higher embryos and a higher pregnancy outcome. So uh, this being something which anyway we are familiar with, it's not a new technique. We anyway know how to do stimulation. So this might give you better outcomes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, madam. Uh, Dr. Josna, you want to add something or you want to give your comment on this? Surely you're welcome. Um, I actually, um, Dr. Pai, Reshma, you have covered it really nicely and extensively from this end to that end. There's nothing much left. Uh, but uh, for the poor responders, it's just the, uh, the practice on the floor as we are NHS, we are not allowed to use adjuvants or unknown protocols. So we still stick to long down regulation or microdose flare. Yeah. So if we do long down regulation and we think we got three or four eggs next cycle, we'll try microdose flare protocol. I did our own audit. There's no huge difference in pregnancy rate, but you might get one or two extra egg. I don't know whether that, that at the end of the day that doesn't matter because birth rates were similar in the same cohort. Um, that's that's what we do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think that that's pretty much has been a standard protocol for many years, a microdose flare. Uh, and then with some new papers, the long down regulation also. In India, I think most people are doing antagonist for poor responders. Again, very well accepted. So I think within the um, system, if we can bring about certain adjustments for poor responders in order to save time, try to get whatever little extra oocytes we can get, uh, it might be beneficial. Thank you. We are trying the double stimulation in yeah. fertility at least because they don't have any time. And if you collect the eggs and you can see that there's still smaller 10, 11 millimeter follicles lurking around, then you just get on with the second stim and get some more yes, eggs. Exactly. We are trying yes. Particularly in cancer patients because there's no time. They're going to go for chemotherapy. So And letrozole works quite well in those people as well. And then you can uh, get a little larger pool of eggs selected. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, there are a few questions I will ask to Dr. Deshma, then I'll come back to Dr. Uh, Jotsna. Uh, Madam Reshma, do you use dual trigger in poor responders? This is Dr. Sutha from Chennai. Yes. Uh, again, there's a lot of really nice papers on dual trigger, and I did mention it. Uh, that you give HCG and along with the HCG you give a small dose of GnRH analog and it appears that you see uh, you get better quality of uh, eggs, better number, better M2s and uh, obviously then better outcomes and since again this is a very simple um, manipulation that you can do that you add GnRH analog to your HCG uh, it might be something that can safely be done. And these are poor responders, so you're not scared to give HCG that the patient will, you know, hyperstimulate or something. So uh, dual trigger is is uh, very much uh, uh, being studied today and is being recommended by some papers, yeah. Uh, well, uh, there's Dr. Anju Cha from Rudrapur. Can we use DHEA for patients with normal AMH? Actually, Why do you I would it? like to do that. Maybe Jotsna can ask that. Please go ahead, Jotsna. No, no, I'm not answering. The question is, why does she want to use it? Yeah. 
because uh, yeah it's specifically actually been studied essentially for poor responders because um, you know dhea has is like some little androgenic effect in the uh, ovary and it helps a little bit to stimulate the follicle growth so it has i think really been studied only in poor responders with a view to improve the outcomes and it does it seems to be one of the adjuvants which may work but like uh, jyotsina said um, in the uk way they are they will only follow if some thing is really sort of proven and they have recommended by the guidelines of uh, uk then they will do it but we here do use a lot of dhgs uh, with the reasonably good results thank you uh, one more question to dr uh, reshma madam this is dr preeti upadhyay from korba how much metroxy progesterone should be given so i think she's talking about the progesterone down regulation and this is a relatively newer concept again lots of uh, studies on it lots of papers because to me it's it's fantastic because you are already giving the patient gonadotropins then you have to start her on another injection of antagonist now we also know that in in antagonist is coming in oral form elagolex is already available in some parts of the world so maybe it will come to india so if you have a oral antagonist it's good but till that time giving so many injections so much cost if we can get reasonably good in if not better outcomes so when your egg is about um 13 14 instead of starting antagonist you start the patient on maybe 10 mg of medroxyprogesterone acetate and you continue it till the trigger it seems to be working equally if not better then uh, antagonist but of course these are still early days and uh, you know not everyone's going to switch to this immediately it's going to take a while but it's an option okay uh, thank you madam now i come up on uh, to dr jyotsna this is a question from dr sutha chennai jyotsna ma'am how to do micro dose flare protocol micro dose flare is technically exactly same as short how much uh, gnrh agonist should be given so yeah so basically the, the, the only difference is the dose of gnrh agonist which is 0.3 mls rather than 0.5 that's the only difference and again there's no huge data support that it does far better than the short flare but it's just traditionally what we had been doing and uh, it, it seems to give a couple of more eggs like i said and we stick to that it doesn't signify there are no data to say that you must do it because it gives you significantly better results because the whole world will do it <laughs> so it's like one of those alteration so for two days three part. days how many days are you giving the uh, uh, till the hcg till the hcg yeah uh, thank you dr shanmu gavali suresh kumar from dindigul what is the impact of high lh in natural and iui cycles that's for jyotsna hi natural cycle in the sense uh, it can't be natural cycle ivf what is the question please uh impact of high lh yeah it is PCOS what is the impact of high lh yeah. in natural and iui cycles Okay, I do not do any IUI in PCOS women. It's very simple. They're anovulatory. If you help them to ovulate, they can have timed sexual intercourse. So we do not have any place for IUI just because you can do it. There's no need. They can have sex. So we do not do IUI. But I think going backward to the high LH, there is some data to suggest that if you can suppress the high LH levels. um either with the pills or um you know that might help to improve the pregnancy rate but in uh, practical life uh, when we do promethine cycles you know you go back to back to back so that you're not wasting the time and um, we just carry on with promethine or letrozole thank you this is dr latika agarwal from bareilly dual trigger dual trigger will be used in antagonist cycle Uh, in antagonist cycle also you can do see the whole reason of antagonist cycle you're doing you can do hcg trigger any time but you avoid hcg trigger and then you do buserlin trigger to avoid ohss 
but if you are doing a stimulation and the follicles are not too many and you're not too much worried about OHSs, you can do dual trigger and fresh transfer. Okay. Actually, I like to ask questions. <laughs> sure. Because I remember when we were in conferences, we used to just give the lecture. And the time used to not be there because most of us would go and shoot beyond our time. <laughs> so we had hardly any time for questions and one question would be asked. Now I'm so happy that there are so many questions from many people across India, from abroad. And it's really happy to see you all answering uh, them so nicely. So good. This is Dr. Nagalakshmi Muddu from Hyderabad. Is it mandatory to do LOD for PCO where the woman is ovulating but no conception? Wow. wow. <laughs> That's too far of overkilling. First and foremost, ovulatory women, there's no place for any ovulatory treatment modalities. She is releasing egg. You don't need to treat her. Leave her alone, then she falls into criteria of unexplained infertility because she's ovulating, semen is fine, tubes are fine. Then you treat her with IVF for unexplained infertility. She is not anovulatory. If she's anovulatory, we are still moving away from laparoscopic ovarian diathermy because of our concerns about the ovarian reserve, etc. But as the guidelines are suggesting, you can still keep it as one of your uh, weapons in your momentarium uh, for second line or third line treatment. We have completely moved away from it, to be honest. But we do do sometimes. We come across some people who have real PCOS ovary. You know, each ovary has like 30, 40 follicles. And they are and they're generally overweight. And they're sensitive to a very small window of FSH. So they do nothing, 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 and boom. You try again, you go even slower, even lower dose, you have to keep increasing. And at a very small window, they just go boom. Those are the only one whom we have thought about taking and doing laparoscopic ovarian diathermy or adding metformin. To be honest, that's the only place in our practice at the moment. But if you go through the guidelines, you can use it as a second or third in anovulatory clomiphene resistant situation. Okay, guys, I hope you have understood what madam has said. Dr. Rishma Pai, I'm not going to leave you. This is Dr. Suta who doesn't want to leave you. He's from Chennai. Very enthusiastic. I have to appreciate that. Yes. She has actually they are amazing. Heard. Yeah, they are, they, are, they are amazing people. There are so many questions. And we are still weekend, so we can have five minutes more. This is Dr. Suta from Chennai. Thank you so much, Dr. Suta. If we use agonist cycle in poor responders, will you use OC pills pre-treatment? And if not, then how will you prevent cyst formation bracket as OC pills are generally used to prevent cyst formation due to initial flare-up by agonist bracket close? <laughs> okay. Actually, the, most uh, people are now moving away from OC pills in the previous cycle. If you do need to use something, prefer to use progesterone or prefer to use estrogen alone. That's one thing. Secondly, like I said, in um, for responder patients, there are a couple of protocols which we have come up with to reduce the LH levels, to synchronize the follicle, which is the biggest problem. Some follicle is ahead, some is behind. They are not growing in synchrony. And so uh, even protocols in which we start with, uh, uh, you know, just giving estrogen for a few days, then once a period comes, we start with the antagonist initially, suppress everything down for a few days, five, six days, then start gonadotropin. The eggs grow. When they grow to 13, 14, again, we start antagonist to prevent the LH surge. And then we give our trigger. So uh, manipulations have been made to uh, do away with this cyst formation and to prevent the high LH and to prevent synchron asynchronous growth. Thank you. Uh, Madam, uh, there are still many questions, but there are excellent uh, comments. I want to take their names. Uh, Dr. Arpita Reddy, Hyderabad. Excellent presentations by all the speakers. 
डॉक्टर विभा वर्मा मुजफ्फरपुर एक्सलेंट लेक्चर रेशमा मैम वन मोर डॉक्टर प्रेरणा जैन फ्रॉम इंदौर शी एज आस्ट यूर क्वेश्चन रेशमा any role of melatonin in poor responders uh actually i haven't really come across too much literature on that to be honest and i have researched a lot so uh, there has been some talks of it some um, studies in the past but uh, like i said the, the recent um, uh, study which i quoted which looks at actually 10 different adjuvants Uh, that was not something which was really focused upon so i think there is some role to play possibly but not really proven and documented yet okay uh, dr sandesh is from vasai uh, this is for dr jochna you can answer even reshma madam uh, the question is can we give dual trigger in duo stimulation i think this question is repeated but probably some of the viewers have joined later on there's too much confusion between the duals dual stimulation dual trigger dual this <laughs> jyotsna you want to take that you want I, to see that okay i'm trying to think back <laughs> in dual stimulation okay you are giving it the trigger collecting and restarting um i don't do it in my practice but i don't see the problem physiologically here reshma would you like to add anything yeah no i think if the, the the thing used to be that when you give a gnrh analog trigger you are sometimes concerned about a fresh transfer and so you were always freezing the uh, eggs but when we are doing a dual stimulation question of transferring doesn't come because anyway we are taking them out we are freezing everything and we are going to start immediately a next stimulation protocol so there may not be a need for a dual trigger because we are not any way transferring in that cycle yes there may be a role to play in the quality of the eggs that you get more m2 so that there's no harm done in that as well but i think most of the dual stem uh, protocols are on gnrh analog trigger and then you start the second cycle after a days gap that's what most of the studies are on well i think i have realized there are a lot of questions and there are many many consultants who want to learn ivf or they have already learned ivf but they still want to update their knowledge so i am going to announce something very big now today with the gracious presence of dr reshma pai and jyotsna pundit and of course we have doyans like rishikesh pai i think we need some course madam we need some small brief to this course so we will surely require your help and support and i'm sure within uh, next 15 days or one month with reshma pai madam and sir and of course pundit madam from uk maybe a two days dedicated course will surely you know sort out all these issues and i'm sure even if we have 30 or 50 members joining it will be a very good learning experience because as science is always changing we are always there to upgrade our knowledge and our skills and it will be a great thing that if you can join us and be a part of this process knowledge is power knowledge is infinite and we are here to give the knowledge and i think that's great that both of you have come there are still questions which are there but most of them have been covered so nicely with both the wonderful ladies who are there it's a lovely evening here in mumbai the first three days we had a whole mumbai rains or you know flooding but luckily we got saved and i'm sure there was no major uh, setbacks especially in human loss but there was lot of flooding and a uh, lot of old trees fell down we felt bad but as you know we are mumbai kurs and we have the spirit of mumbai and we are going to a uh, rise up from phoenix and from the ashes so great <laughs> thank you both of you and i would like to end uh, the show with a slide presentation being there and uh, don't forget to look for joy be happy look pleasant look very uh, uh, good at your heart and soul and then you will be a very successful man fulfilled women and absolutely in small small little things in every day 
I would say every hour and every time of your day, you will be a blessed soul and a blessed person. So with this, we end the show. And it was wonderful to have you both. Keep doing your work with utmost happiness and passion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thanks, Jyotsana, for spending so much time with us. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Jyotsana, Madam. Thank you, Madam.